Yeah, welcome to the part two of the International Christian University Linguistic Colloquium. I'm uh, Sungun Lee from International Christian University. Uh, the topic of this season's ICU link is African linguistics. Today we have two talks by uh, Jason Kendibovich from uh, CUNY Graduate Center and Mark Baker from Rutgers University. Now, uh, before further uh, do you like, uh, let me introduce the first speaker. Uh, Dr. Kendibovich is an Associate Professor of Linguistics at the Graduate Center of CUNY, City University of New York. He works on syntax uh, about languages of West Africa in particular, and his research interests include uh, syntactic theory, the syntax phonology interface, language documentation, and uh, uh, several aspects of the Niger Congo languages of West Africa. Uh, the languages he researches are either endangered or underdocumented, so he uh, is contributing a lot uh, in our in improving our understanding of these languages. Uh, Dr. Kandibovic uh, authored uh, multiple books, including uh, Anti-Contiguity, The Grammar of Repetition, and also Africa's Endangered Languages. He has also published numerous articles in scholarly journals and edited volumes. Today, uh, Dr. Kandibovic will talk about two unexpected aspects of a Shupamem ABA system. Welcome. It's very good to have you here. Thank you, Sonon. Um, let's see, I'll share my slides here. Hopefully you can see them. Yes, we can see them. Um, okay, wonderful. Um, so thank you for that wonderful introduction and, and also um, thank you, you wanna... for, um, <laughs> is that good? That should be better. Yes, it's good, it's good. Yeah. So thanks Sung Hun for the introduction and uh, thanks to the ICU community for, uh, for inviting me. Um, I wanna begin by just acknowledging uh, my colleagues and collaborators, um, uh, Laziz and Chari of um, St. John's University, uh, Hagai Shur uh, from the Graduate Center and a number of uh, my students from uh, field methods class where uh, a lot of this material uh, began its um, intellectual life. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking um, about Shupamam, the Shupamam language. Uh, Shupamam is an Eastern Grassfields Bantu language of Cameroon, spoken in the Western province uh, of the country by about 420,000 speakers. Um, it's also known in the literature as Bamun, but um, mostly uh, Shupamam. So I'm gonna talk about um, two aspects uh, of the Shupamam ABAR system in this uh, talk. Um, the first is uh, the integration status of non-restrictive relative clauses. And the second is um, the ABAR transparency of certain domains that we would classically think of as um, strong islands. Uh, and just before we get started to give you a preview of the results, um, within the domain of um, non-restrictive relative clauses, um, I'm gonna show that non-restrictive relative clauses in the language have the same syntactic properties as the restrictive ones do, and are um, clause internal nominally integrated syntactic objects. And in uh, so showing that, um, I'll be providing support for Cinque's 2008 typology of non-restrictive relative clauses. On the side of um, islands, uh, I hope to show you that um, classic opaque configurations for a bar movement do not have the status of islands in, in the language. Here's a roadmap for uh, how I'll proceed. So part one will be about uh, the non-restrictive relative clauses. And I'll begin by um, giving a background on Cinque's uh, typology of non-restrictive relative clauses. And then we'll, um, look at an overview of relative clauses in the language, and then follow that up with the evidence um, for the uh, clausal integration analysis. And I'll focus here on uh, five um, pieces of evidence, although I have um, many more lines of evidence, uh, and we could talk about those in the Q&A if you're interested. I've just whittled it down to five here just to make sure that uh, the material fits within the allotted time space. After uh, presenting the evidence, we'll consider whether the findings are expected or unexpected. Uh, then when we go over to the absence of islands portion of the talk, um, we will begin by just looking at the facts. So I'll show you the, uh, the data that suggests there is uh, movement. 
And um, after that, I'll provide evidence for movement out of the islands from the considerations of crossover effects, parasitic gap licensing, and reconstruction effects. And then conclude by uh, looking at whether this is uh, expected or unexpected from various perspectives. So uh, we'll begin um, with uh, an overview of non-restrictive relative clauses in uh, the Cinque 2008 and 2020 framework, where Cinque proposed that there isn't just one type of non-restrictive relative clause out there, that there are broadly speaking two. Um, the first one is the integrated variety, which is a kind of relative clause where the relative clause is generated internally to the nominal projection containing the relative clause head and where the uh, merge position of that relative clause positions it such that we are well within the domain of sentence grammar where things like binding and movement um, take place. The other type of a non-restrictive uh, relative clause is basically the English style, uh, the non-integrated style, where uh, the relative clause is generated independently or outside of the sentence or nominal projection containing the relative clause, and um, where uh, we'll be in the domain of uh, discourse grammar uh, in the sense of uh, William 77. So on that note, um, these um, non-integrated uh, non-restrictive non relative clauses make use of relativizers or pronouns that relate to the relative clause head in a way that's comparable to how E-type pronouns and demonstratives relate to their, dis, uh, their antecedents across discourse. Um, so the most thoroughly studied RC systems um, in the world, um, examples of which would be English, uh, are systems that do not have the integrated variety of the non-restrictive relative clause. And so our understanding of the nature of non-restrictive relative clauses, uh, Cinque showed, was, is, is incomplete and is actually biased towards analyses that are proposed on the basis of English style non-restrictives. So Cinque's work basically showed that um, non-restrictive relative clause syntax is less well understood, uh, less uh, well studied. So in uh, the works that I just alluded to, Cinque shows that Italian has both the integrated and the non-integrated varieties of non-restrictive relative clauses. Um, in work that begins with Zhang and goes through Delgabo and Lin and Tsai, uh, it's been argued in uh, my opinion successfully that Mandarin Chinese is a language whose non-restrictive relative clauses are exclusively of the integrated variety. And so Mandarin Chinese and Italian uh, raise the typological question about whether the integrated type of non-restrictive relative clauses is something that's common or, or something that's rare. And again, since uh, not, much, uh, not as much research on non-restrictive relative clauses uh, has taken place, uh, this is currently an open typological question. So we can uh, talk about Schupemann relative clauses uh, first uh, in this overview. So first things first, uh, Schupemann is a head initial SVO language. Um, relative clauses in the language are post-nominal and externally headed. So you've got two examples in one A and B. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, I will not be uh, pronouncing these structures. Uh, Basically a year or so ago, I, I, I think I would have had the confidence to pronounce these, um, but now that um, I've been out of the Shupamam loop for about a year or so, I have to say my pronunciation has atrophied a little, so I won't be pronouncing, pronouncing these. Um, so in um, the data that follows, I will um, color the head of the relative clause red so that it's just easy to track when you look at the data. So what you see in 1A and B is a, again, post-nominal, externally headed relative clause structure. Um, and we can see that the relativized nominals are represented inside the relative clause as resumptive pronouns in the case of subject relativization, as in 1A, we have uh, the resumptive pronoun here. And although it's not shown on the screen, um, the indirect object, if relativized, 
would be represented inside um, as a resumptive cone. Um, direct objects, as you can see in 1B, uh, are gapped, uh, the representation. Um, one uh, example one is repeated at the bottom of the screen so that you can see that um, there's agreement between the head of the relative clause and the relative pronoun, but in number only. So in 1A, we have a person singular as the head and we get the ua form of the relative uh, relativizer. And in 1B, we have the plural people and we get the pua version um, of that item. So um, shupamam has these relativizers, ua and pua, but no other ones. So uh, shupamam lacks a wh relative pronouns. So these are the only two relativizers that we have. Um, so the relativizer marks the left edge of the relative clause and the right edge of the relative clause is marked by this invariant uh, relative complementizer, a na. Now, uh, it's been claimed that in West, uh, in African languages in general, um, formal distinctions are not made between restrictive and non-restrictive relative clauses. And Shupamam is a language where that generalization is embodied. So in 2a, I have a relative clause whose head is a proper name, Mimsha, it's the name of a man. Um, and in 2b, we have the pronoun uh, e, which is a gender neutral third person singular pronoun, him or her. And you can see that um, the material that follows the head uh, looks identical in both uh, 2a and b. So uh, I'll say that these uh, rcs in 2 are formally indistinguishable from the cases that you saw in 1, where the head was a nominal. And the data here are repeated again at the bottom of the screen. So I'll say that the RCs in two are um, semantically non-restrictive in virtue of taking proper name and pronominal antecedents. And so in this talk, I'm gonna assume that relative clauses that are headed by proper names and pronouns are non-restrictive. And therefore, when we look at the three uh, examples that we've seen so far, we can see that there's a formal identity between restrictives as in one and non-restrictives as in two. And I can also point out that there's no prosodic difference uh, that I've been able to determine between restrictives like what you see in one and non-restrictives like in two. So that's the overview uh, of Schupemann relative clauses. Now I wanna turn to five lines of evidence that non-restrictive relative clauses in the language are integrated. And the running theme here is going to be, I'm choosing diagnostics that in the literature have been shown to give rise to asymmetries in languages between restrictive and non-restrictive relative clauses. And what we're gonna find is that in Shupamam, no such asymmetry exists, meaning that the restrictive types and the non-restrictive types behave in the same exact way and in a way that suggests that the relative clause is uh, integrated into the clause. So we'll begin with uh, VP ellipsis, where uh, it's been pointed out in that in languages like English, the antecedent of VP ellipsis can include a restrictive relative clause, but uh, not a non-restrictive one. So in 3A, my mother liked the pizza that I baked, but my brother did not. The, um, the, the elided constituent is interpreted as including the relative clause. So my brother did not like the pizza that I baked. In the case of 3b, where we have a non-restrictive relative clause, we don't see that kind of interpretive possibility. So my mother likes pizza, which I bake well, but my brother does not. This means my brother does not like pizza. So the RC is not included in the antecedent in the case of a non-restrictive relative clause in English. And so this ability of an RC to be included in the antecedent of uh, VP ellipsis directly tests whether the relative clause in the antecedent is um, clausally integrated or not. So here, I'm just gonna give you uh, a simple example of VP ellipsis in the language. Um, 4A is the unelided version of 4B. And so what we're looking at here in these examples are gonna be uh, two, instance, uh, two clauses that are coordinated. There's a, a, a phonetically null coordinator. So we have I, no, Mimsha, null coordinator. You, too, no, Mimsha. And the particle two is inflected um, for the subject. In 4B, we've simply elided the uh, Yi Mimsha uh, 
part, and that's uh, our VP ellipsis structure. So what do we see in um, RC context? Well, what we see is that in Shupamam, the antecedent of VP ellipsis always includes the relative clause, regardless of whether the RC in question is restrictive, i.e. headed by something like person, nominal like person, or non-restrictive, headed by a proper name like Nefira in 5b, or a pronoun like you in 5c. So in all of these examples, um, we have, again, uh, two clauses being coordinated by a phonetically null marker. So Mimsha knows person that Musa C and Raye too. And native speakers will tell you that the interpretation of the elided VP is that Raye knows the person that Musa saw, not just the person, not just knows the person. And the same is true in 5b, where the VP antecedent contains a relative clause headed by a proper name, Nafira, and a pronoun like uh, Mu, you. Now, this, it, it's one thing for a native speaker to say uh, that these are the interpretations, but we can actually be a little more rigorous in providing evidence that the antecedent actually contains the relative clause, even in these cases of non-restrictive relatives. And the evidence comes from instances where we replace the subject of the relative clause with a pronoun and then find that in VP ellipsis context, we get ambiguities of a strict and sloppy identity nature. So I'll walk you through some of these. So in 6a, we have uh, Mimsha knows Mephira, who he saw, and Raye too. Um, so now in this particular case, the, the pronoun E uh, can refer back to Mimsha. And one possible interpretation uh, of the elided VP is the strict identity reading where um, uh, Raye knows Mephira who Mimsha saw. But there's another interpretation where Raye knows Mephira who Raye, who she saw. And so that is a sloppy identity reading. Um, and that would only be possible if um, the relative clause was included in the uh, antecedent. Same is true in 6b. The only difference between 6a and 6b is that the head of the relative clause is the pronoun you. We still have this pronoun pronominal subject and we get uh, readings where um, Raye saw, uh, uh, sorry, Mimsha saw Raye or uh, Raya saw, right? Sorry, I think I said that wrong about Raya saw Raya, but you get the idea here. There's a, a strict and a sloppy identity um, ambiguity here. So these VP ellipsis facts furnish uh, an argument, I think, that restrictive and non restrictive RCs uh, pattern together in the language. And the interpretive facts show that the, uh, both RCs uh, must be integrated into the clause. The next um, consideration comes from binding. So it's been claimed uh, that um, when it comes to, let's say variable binding, matrix quantifiers in English can bind pronouns inside restrictive relative clauses, but not pronouns inside of non-restrictives. So in 7a, we have every Christian forgives a man who harms him, where a variable binding, a bound variable reading for him is possible, but in 7b, the bound variable interpretation of him is not possible. And that uh, is attributed to the fact that we're dealing with a non-restrictive relative clause here. So this is a, a, a well-known binding asymmetry in a language like English. In Shupamam, there is no such comparable asymmetry, meaning that um, RC external quantifiers can bind RC internal variables regardless of whether the relative clause is restrictive headed by a nominal or non-restrictive headed by either a proper name or a pronoun. So in 8a, for instance, we have every person saw the child that bothered pronoun and this pronoun gets a bound variable reading, but it also gets a bound variable reading in 8b when the head of the relative clause is Mimsha and in 8c when the head of the relative clause is uh, U. 
So the bound variable reading is, is possible across the board. It doesn't discriminate uh, among RC types. Another binding asymmetry that's known has to do with anaphore uh, binding. So in um, Italian, um, non-restrictive, uh, anaphores inside non-restrictive relative clauses cannot be uh, bound, um, but they can be bound uh, inside restrictive relative clauses. Um, but in Schupemann, once again, there's no asymmetry like that. Um, if you put an anaphore inside a relative clause, you can find that that anaphore is bound by some element outside of the relative clause, regardless of whether the relative clause is uh, restrictive as in 9a or non-restrictive as in 9b or 9c. So uh, Schupemann is a language that has two types of anaphores. It has a long distance anaphore and a local anaphore. The long distance anaphore is used in 9a, it's head body. And when you throw that um, um, anaphore in this relative clause, you get an ambiguity. The anaphore can be bound um, by the matrix subject mimsha or by the relative clause head man. Same is true um, in uh, the case of 9b, the long distance anaphore can be bound either by the matrix subject uh, mimsha or by the relative clause head raye. And then in 9c, I've just switched to the local anaphore where the anaphore is bound by the, um, the head of the relative clause u. So, Basically, restrictive and non-restrictive relative clauses behave identically with respect to both uh, anaphore binding, which we just saw, and variable binding, which we previously saw. And so the fact that binding into both kinds of relative clauses is possible, once again, I think suggests that both restrictive and non-restrictive relative clauses are, in fact, clausally integrated. Next, um, we can uh, look at weak crossover effects, where again, there's a known asymmetry in some languages. Um, so it's been um, observed that in restrictive relative clauses, uh, you'll find weak crossover effects, but non-restrictive relative clauses seem to be immune to creating them. Um, Cinque showed the same is true um, in Italian. And we can see that in Schupemann, the data in 10, show that unlike those languages, there's no comparable um, asymmetry, which is to say that we get weak crossover effects across the board, regardless of whether we're dealing with a restrictive relative clause as in 10A or a non-restrictive as in uh, 10B and C. So in 10A, the head of the relative is man, and we have, uh, and so this is a, an object relative. So man, we would, uh, say originates in the object position of C. And then we have this uh, non-C commanding possessive pronoun uh, on the uh, subject of the relative clause, his child. And in this configuration, the head of the relative man must be um, disjoint in reference from the uh, possessor of child, the his of his child. Okay. Same is true in 10B and 10C, where the relative clause head is Musa or a pronoun in 10C. So we get these weak crossover effects regardless of uh, our C type. And uh, the fact that all of these relative clause types are susceptible to these weak crossover effects, once again, puts the two relative clause types on the same footing. And again, strongly suggests that the non-restrictive relatives, just like the restrictive relatives, are clausally integrated in the language. Next, let's look at parasitic gaps. Um, so in English, um, it's uh, known that there's another asymmetry whereby parasitic gaps can appear inside restrictive uh, relative clauses, like in 11a, John is a man that everyone that knows admires, but we don't get parasitic gaps inside of non-restrictive relative clauses. So uh, John is a man who Bill, who knows, admires, that's out. So, um, there's a similar asymmetry in Italian that uh, Cinque pointed out. So we can wonder what, is, what happens in Schupemann. But surprise, surprise, uh, just like all of the other considerations, we find no comparable asymmetry in this language, which is to say that parasitic gaps are licensed inside both the restrictive and the non-restrictive RC types. So I'll walk you through the data here, 12A, 
just sets up the base structure and introduces the illicit gap that will be licensed in the uh, relative clauses below. So in the relative clause in 12a, we have either every person as the head or Musa or he or she. So this means something like every person or Musa or he, she who knows loves the child. And so the, the, uh, the missing object of no is the unlicensed gap here that makes the structure illicit. And if we relativize child in 12a, then uh, we end up um, licensing the uh, illicit gap that we see in 12a. So when we uh, relativize child and put it in a carrier sentence, we'd get something like 12b. This is the child that every person that knows loves, where now the gap is, uh, is licensed. So the parasitic gap here, e, um, occurs inside this uh, relative clause. And it's also licensed inside the non-restrictive relatives in 12C and D, which are almost identical to what you see in 12B, except they're headed by Musa in 12C and he or she in 12D. Uh, so parasitic gap licensing um, happens across the board as well. So this connectivity between parasitic gaps inside of non-restrictive relative clauses and other uh, A-bar traces once again, supports the conclusion that non-restrictive relative clauses in the language are clausally integrated structures. The last consideration uh, I'll give you has to do with um, split antecedents, where uh, there is a, a, another famous asymmetry uh, in some languages. So in Italian, only non-integrated relative clauses um, can have split antecedents. So non-restrictive, non-integrated RCs show split antecedents in Italian. And in English, only non-restrictive relative clauses, which according to Cinque, recall, are non-integrated. Only the non-restrictive relatives of English allow for split antecedents. So you can see this exemplified in 13. Um, Kim likes muffins, but Sandy prefers scones, which they eat with jam. The witch here is able to pick up muffins and scones as uh, the split antecedents. Um, but if we change the relativizer to that and force uh, the restrictive reading, Kim likes muffins, but Sandy prefers scones that they eat with jam is now um, ungrammatical. Okay, so uh, if, as we've been arguing all along, that Shupamam non-restrictive relative clauses are integrated, then the prediction is that um, split antecedents should be impossible in Shupamam relative clauses headed by proper names and pronouns. And this is exactly what's borne out um, as shown in 14b and c. Um, here, the way I'm going to show the impossibility of split antecedents is to show that um, a reciprocal in the relative clause, in the object position of the relative clause, something that requires a plural antecedent is not licensed. So um, in 14, uh, I'll walk you through the example. So we're gonna have um, the covert coordination of two clauses once again, and we're gonna form a relative clause which attempts to pick up the objects of the two uh, clauses as its antecedents. So Raye greeted the mother, null and, Musa greeted the father, plural relativizer, plural resumptive pronoun since this is a subject relative clause, and then love each other. And so this structure is impossible in the language. And I take it because the each other expression is not licensed due to the fact that mother and father are not both available to serve as antecedents. 14b just takes 14a and replaces mother and father with two proper names, Mimsha and Mathira. And again, the same reciprocal is impossible in that environment. And then in 14C, I replace Mimsha and Mafira with pronouns like uh, you and uh, him or her. And again, the, uh, the reciprocal is not licensed. So uh, the prediction that split antecedents are impossible in Shupamamar C is headed by proper names and pronouns 
uh, is borne out. And yet, and this is yet another way in which Shupamam restrictives and non-restrictives pattern together. Neither type uh, allows for split antecedents, which is consistent with our um, integrated uh, analysis. So now we can ask whether this is expected or unexpected. So the conclusion that non-restrictive RCs are integrated is actually in line with uh, Chinque's claim that when you find restrictive and non-restrictive RCs uh, behaving in a way in, that is syntactically indistinguishable, only the integrated variety is present in the language. Um, Chinque claims that only um, WH relative pronouns can be used to form the non-integrated, non-restrictive relative clause variety because WH relative pronouns are demonstrative-like and have related usage as E-type pronouns. So given that Shupamam lacks WH relative pronouns, as we've seen, it's perhaps not surprising that it also lacks the non-integrated, non-restrictive uh, relative clause variety, making use of the uh, of the integrated variety exclusively. Um, but from a typological perspective, we might be surprised by Shupamum's exclusive um, a variety of integrated uh, non-restrictive relative because um, the present stock uh, of languages manifesting integrated non-restrictive relative clauses includes just a few entries and most of them are of European stock. So I've listed the languages at the bottom of the slide that Cinque claims have uh, that Chinque claims are languages that have both integrated and non-integrated um, relative clauses. Um, but there are um, fewer languages that have exclusively integrated non-restrictive relative clauses. Um, these have been claimed to be Japanese, Mandarin Chinese, Northern Italian, Basque, and Yoruba. And if the arguments from the previous slides go through, Shupamam would be added as, um, as a sixth. So at the end of the day, I don't think that this type of uh, relative clause is actually rare. I think it just seems that way, given the dominance of English and European languages in um, relative clause research, non-restrictive relative clause research. And my hunch is that most African languages will end up having the exclusive integrated non-restrictive relative clause. Okay, so now we can turn to part two. Uh, this, this is a little, a little quicker, where we'll look at uh, the absence of islands in Shupamum, and we'll start by orienting to the facts. So what I'm gonna do here is um, show you a number of structures that are classically thought to be strong islands cross-linguistically, and to show that a bar movement out of them is possible. Um, so I'm gonna show you um, the sentential subject configuration, complex noun phrases, and uh, adjunct clauses. And the way I'm gonna go about doing this is to topicalize something from uh, the relevant domain. But I could have also done focus movement or WH movement. I just chose to simplify the presentation and make it uniformly topicalization. But equally possible are the cases of uh, focus. So in 15A, you see a sentential subject construction that Raye saw the chair. It's possible to topicalize chair. So you begin by uh, using an expletive, ah, then you have your topic marker, then chair, and then the rest of the structure with the gap in the extraction site. And so this structure, as for the chair that Raye saw, surprised Mimsha, is um, well formed. Here in 16, I have uh, complex noun phrases, the definite relative clause type. So Raya knows the man uh, that bought uh, the house. I can uh, topicalize house as in 16B and the structure is perfectly good. 17 is, uh, 17A is a clausal complement of noun. Mimsha heard the story that Raya ate fufu and in 17B, I have topicalized fufu and the result is perfectly good. And then lastly, we have our adjunct clauses. Um, I have temporal clauses shown in 18A. Mimsha broke the mirror before Raye saw the house. Possible to topicalize house out of the before clause. 19 shows a reason clause. Mimsha left on reason that Raye hit the chair. So this is effectively a relative clause structure with reason as its head. And in 19B, I've topicalized chair. 
And then conditional clauses in the language look like what you see in 20A, um, preceding, immediately preceding the conditional marker is the subject of the sentence. So Mimsha, if, sees the house, then Rae will leave, and I can topicalize house um, and get back a perfectly grammatical structure. There are a number of other, what we might call classic strong islands and uh, weak islands, in fact, uh, that I'm not showing you here. And again, we can talk about that in the Q&A period. Um, but there are also domains that freely allow for topicalization and focus movement. So with regard to the data that I did show, we can entertain two options. One of them would be that the topicalized constituent X truly undergoes a bar movement out of the relevant island. And a second option would be to say that um, the uh, topicalized constituent X is base generated in its surface position and binds an empty category in the island, as you see schematized in two. So I'm gonna argue for analysis two on the basis of uh, three diagnostics, concluding that those uh, strong island structures, the classically strong island structures in 15 to 20 don't have island status uh, in Shupamum. Um, and I'll leave explaining the absence of those island effects for another day, since uh, that's beyond the scope uh, of the talk. So we can start by looking at um, crossover effects. So in cases of crossover, uh, A-bar moved elements cannot move across C commanding pronouns that they end up binding in the case of strong crossover, nor can they move across non-C command pronouns that they end up binding, uh, in, and that would be weak crossover. So we have an, a strong crossover configuration in 21B, but it's built up from 21A where we have uh, WH and C2 in object position. So he or she saw who, um, and now if I WH move, I produce the construction in 21B where uh, the, this, is a, uh, this, this instance of focusing is a cleft-like structure. So the structure begins with an expletive as did the topicalization structure. Then we have our focused constituent, and then we have the relativizer, and then um, we have our final relative complementizer, but it surfaces with a falling tone, which is the realization of the Q particle. So in this case, when we move who from the object position of C over the C commanding pronoun, we find that we cannot get an interpretation where who binds the subject pronoun, who and the subject pronoun must be uh, disjoint. So that's a strong crossover effect. Uh, a weak crossover effect is shown in 22. So if we have a possessive pronoun, uh, his or her child, and we try to WH uh, cleft uh, over that um, possessive pronoun, um, we'll find that the WH item um, cannot be co-referent with, um, cannot bind uh, the pronoun below. It must be uh, disjoint in reference from it. So now if we uh, put this into practice and look at what happens in sentential subject constructions, we find that um, we get both strong and weak crossover effects um, when we try to WH cleft from the object position of a sentential subject as shown in 23A and 23B is the weak crossover uh, version of that. Um, here in 24, I'm just showing you um, a complex noun phrase construction, the, the definite relative clause construction. So the man that um, he saw where we're WH moving out of the object position. When we do that, um, we will get uh, strong crossover effects and as in 24B, uh, weak crossover effects in this uh, configuration. Um, I'm gonna skip this slide for time. Just this shows that there are again, strong and weak crossover effects in the clausal complement of noun construction. And then lastly, for the conditionals, I'll just illustrate with one variety, the, the so-called uh, adjunct conditional clauses. So here's our if clause, and we're gonna WH cleft out of the object position. And when we do that, we find that WH cannot bind the subject pronoun uh, or the possessive pronoun. So we get strong and weak crossover effects. Similar effects would obtain um, in the other types of um, adjunct clauses, the temporal and the reason types. Parasitic gap licensing is another uh, diagnostic we can use. So in parasitic gap licensing, an illicit gap is licensed in the presence of a non-C commanding A bar gap. 
So to illustrate, here we have uh, 27A. Mimsha saw the house before uh, buying the house. If I remove the object house, I create an illicit gap. Mimsha saw the house before buying. Now that um, gap in 27B will be licensed if we topicalize house. So as for the house, Mimsha saw gap before buying parasitic gap and the structure is licensed. So we can use parasitic gaps uh, licensing as a diagnostic for AVAR movement. And we find that in sentential subject constructions, like uh, the one you see here in 28A, if I omit the object of cook in the before clause, we've got an illicit uh, gap in that construction. But if I uh, topicalize fufu from the sentential subject, uh, the gap that was previously impossible in 28A becomes licensed in 28B, suggesting uh, an A bar gap to license it. Same can be shown for um, complex NPs like definite relative clauses. Um, here, Raye knows the man um, who bought the house before seeing where the gap in the object of C position is illicit. It becomes licit if you topicalize house as in 29B. Again, suggesting the presence of the A-bar movement. Uh, I won't show the clausal complement of noun construction for reasons of time. And in the domain of adjunct clauses, I'll just illustrate a reason clause. So here we have our on reason that Mimsha bought house before C gap. The gap there is bad. If we topicalize house, the structure is licensed. And we'll see similar effects in temporal and conditional clause constructions. Lastly, and really quick, we can look at reconstruction effects where an A-bar displaced constituent will behave as if it occupies a lower structural position with respect to binding theoretic considerations. So in 32A, Nimsha saw a picture of himself. If we um, topicalize picture of himself, we find no principle A violation, suggesting that picture of himself is reconstructed in its uh, pre-movement position. So we find these reconstruction effects um, when an anaphore containing constituent inside a sentential subject is topicalized, as you see in 33. As for the story about him, uh, herself, that Raye told surprised Mimsha, where uh, the anaphore refers back to the subject of the sentential subject. In um, definite relative clause constructions, as for the picture uh, of himself, Raya knows the man um, who saw, and here um, we get no principal A effect as well. And then lastly, to showcase the adjunct clauses, if we look at a temporal clause, a before clause, um, as for the picture of herself, Mimsha broke the camera before Raya saw. So we're seeing um, crossover effects, parasitic gap licensing, and reconstruction effects within these purported island configurations, leading, I think, to the conclusion that A-bar movement is taking place out of these domains. And so the question is, how surprising is that absence of islands? Well, from a generative perspective, it's very unexpected. Um, the, the transparent domains that we've been looking at um, constitute these domains that we feel are, uh, we often view as being cross-linguistically stable and maybe even universal um, strong islands. But from an Africanist perspective, um, it might not be so unexpected because recent work has uncovered a number of um, canonical island configurations across a variety of languages where um, ABAR dependency formation seems to proceed unhindered. So some examples here um, are presented at the bottom of the screen. And you can see that this is very recent work. So this is all work that's sort of come out in the last couple of years. Um, we see um, this in Majumba and Limbum, which are both related to Shupamam. These are both grass fields Bantu languages, but unlike Shupamam, Majumba and Limbum don't have nearly as much um, uh, ABAR transparency across a, a variety of uh, islands like we've seen. Um, in Ikpana, which is a language of uh, Ghana that I've also worked on, uh, 
all adjunct clauses are transparent for a bar formation, but all of the other uh, strong islands are truly strong islands. So there's kind of uh, a selective transparency in that language. Um, and then Asante tree, Igbo, and Swahili are also some languages that have been shown in the literature to, um, to show this kind of transparency. So to, to end here, the uh, implications of these findings, I believe, are, are twofold. Um, one, they have the potential to shape the landscape of future research on islands, help us understand what exactly islands are, how they form, and um, why they aren't islands in some cases. And on um, a broader uh, note, uh, these kinds of findings clearly demonstrate the value of understudied African languages like Shupamam um, for, uh, for linguistic theory. So I'll end with that. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. <clears throat> Thank you. Now I have we some have... references. Yes. Oh, I was going to say I have some references here that you guys can check out uh, in the handout if you'd like. Um, but yep. So now we have uh, some time for questions uh, or comments. So anybody have? Oh, Mark, that was a <laughs> applause, right? Not a question or <laughs> comment. <laughs> yeah. I'll be happy to uh, put the slides up again if, if anyone needs to reference them right. for their question. Oh, it seems like Mark also has a <laughs> raised his hand. Yeah, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Can hear you. All right. So my computer gets confused sometimes when I plug in and out uh, my headphones. Yeah. So um, great, um, compelling field work. Um, cool and um, systematic over a wide range of things. Um, let me um, ask a question about the, the restrictive, non restrictive relative clause part. Sure. So um, I don't know anything in particular. I don't know anything about um, semantics, um, but it was sort of um, striking that you had all this rich evidence that they were um, integrated, but, um, but do we know that they're non-restrictive? There you were assuming if the head was a, was a, um, a, a name or a pronoun that that would qualify as um, non-restricted semantically. Um, but I was wondering if we could um, push on that a little bit. So, you know, it seems clear that there are, there's only one type of relative clause. Sometimes it's restrictive. What would be involved in saying it was always restrictive? Well, if what restrictive means is that um, you have, you know, um, like you um, have the intersection of two predicates, something like that. Um, well, you could imagine that you have the intersection of two predicates in these cases too, but one of them refers to a singleton and the other one includes that singleton. So just the intersection doesn't give you anything different in that case. Maybe you could say it is a restrictive relative clause, but it's not doing any non-trivial restriction because of the nature of the head. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Do you know why that's a non-starter or any any comments or reactions to that? I don't I like you, I don't know uh, too much about the semantics of these things. And I don't know that it's not a non-starter. It could be. And I appreciate the comment because um, you know, th th this question is something that keeps me up at night. H how do we know that relative clauses headed by proper names and pronouns aren't restrictive? The only thing that I can think of is that the job of a relative clause, a restrictive relative clause is to restrict the reference of its head. So if the head is something whose reference doesn't need restricting, then in what sense uh, could it possibly be a restrictive relative clause? Now, the, 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 the view that you just gave could be one of them, right? We, it's just a sort of trivial, uh, a trivial kind of intersection. 
But beyond that, yeah, I really don't know. That's why I sort of appeal to the, the classic, you know, Jack and Doff. Uh, if the head is a proper name or a pronoun, it must be non-restrictive. That's sort of the best I have at this point. But yeah, uh, I think I want to think more about that. And um, nothing about what you said strikes me as a non-starter. I'd have to unpack it more. Maybe talk to some semanticists about, about what they think about that. I just, you know, imagine, you know, as we do, suppose that we started with the African languages and didn't know about Indo-European, then I suppose we would feel compelled to give a unified analysis of all relative clauses. <laughs> um, so imagine what that would be, you know, I, I just did it or, or so on. And then, you know, maybe, maybe that's true. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe, maybe yeah. we don't have to see it as restrictive, non-restrictive. They're just relative clauses. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I appreciate the comment. I'll, I'll think more about that. You've given me, you've given me a nice angle, I think, to think about it. Thank you. Uh, we have maybe uh, time for one or question or comments, uh, Michael. Yeah. Um, this is also, uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, this is also sort of more of a background um, a question, um, but a little bit more low level. Uh, uh, one thing I've never understood with the, um, the so-called lack of um, um, identity with the non-restrictive relative clauses. So, um, you know, like I, John likes uh, uh, the pizza which I made and so does Mary means the pizza that I made. But the, with the non-restrictive, um, my mother, the, I think your example was my mother likes pizza which I make very well and so does John. Um, but if you make pizza, but if, if, uh, when you say I may jump, my mother likes pizza, which I make very well, then it's a property of pizza that you make it very well. And so it therefore must be part, uh, I don't understand how it's not part of the, um, of how it doesn't carry over in VP ellipsis there. So the idea in the sentence, I mean, the discourse grammar analysis would be that the non, the non integrated non restrictive relative would be sort of uh, adjoined or attached somehow to the to the entire clause and be outside of the, the, the domain of the rest of the material. So uh, even though so in, in some sense, it kind of like extra poses, uh, maybe at LF, and, and that's the sense in which it's not within the VP. So when ellipsis targets VP, uh, the, 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 the thing that it's targeting doesn't include that non-restrictive relative at all. But yeah, in the case well, of restrictives, it's, it is. Yeah, so structurally it makes sense, but um, then I should be able to say, um, my mother likes pizza, which, my, which I make very well. Uh, uh, but John likes pizza, which I don't make very well, which is quite, which is a contradiction. Mm -hmm. um, so if it's a general property of pizza that you make it very well, then how do you tease apart a reading in which, so with the restrictive relative clause, you can, you know, like John likes the pizza that I bought, but Mary likes the pizza that Susan bought. Um, and, or, but John, or that, but John likes pizza, the pizza that I didn't buy that somebody else bought. And so you can, you know, you can create a situation where you can get this contrast, but with a non-restrictive, you can't. Like, so I can't tease apart a meaning in which the, uh, the non-restrictive relative clause is not conceivably part of the uh, uh, ellipsis. Semantically, I know, I know structurally it's not, but semantically it's, it, it, I can't sort of like, um, you know what I mean? Uh, I'm not, I'm sort of yeah. expressing myself uh, clearly here. I, would it be possible for you to repeat that original example you gave that had that kind of contradiction in it? Oh, okay. So my mother likes pizza, which I make very well. Um, and John likes pizza, which I don't make very well at all. You know, like either you make pizza well or you don't. Yeah, yeah. But there's no ellipsis there, right? Oh, um, yeah, that one doesn't contain ellipsis, but uh, it, I should be able to get that reading 
on the, with the alighted. Um, uh, so my mother likes pizza, which I make very well, um, uh, but John doesn't. So if the non-restrictive relative clause is not part of the uh, of the alighted uh, is not part of the alighted element, then um, it, if the if the alighted element is just you know, but John doesn't like pizza. Period. Then it should be any pizza. Yeah, I, I, that that's a that interpretation is perfectly available for me. The one that you that, that's impossible because it's a property of pizza that you make it well. Yeah. So, somehow, I, right. I'd have to think more about that, but it 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 doesn't have an incoherent interpretation for me. Oh, okay. It has an incoherent interpretation for me. Um, maybe I uh, have to think about it more too. But maybe uh, maybe we can ask Mark as another na English native English speaker if that had a coherent or incoherent reading. I wasn't able to parse the sentences as they came. And I admit to being a little distracted by having to give my own talk in a few minutes. Oh, OK. <laughs> so Mike, Mike, I'll, I'll, I'll... Do you want to give it one more time? Uh, OK. Um, my mother likes pizza, which I make very well, uh, but John doesn't. Now, that assumedly contains, but John doesn't like pizza, period. Therefore, it should be um, it could it should be able to have the meaning that uh, John likes pizza, which I don't make very well, unfortunately. Uh, which is of course a contradiction because I just stated in the previous sentence that you know it's a property of pizza that I make it very well. Um, so it's impossible. I see. So it's an issue about it's an issue about whether the whether the relative clause is under the scope of the negation in the second clause. Uh, no, it's more an effect no. of like it's a the, the other reading is impossible given the antecedent. The antecedent is uh, it's a it's a property of pizza that I make it very well, and so I can't negate that in any future statement. Otherwise, I've just lied. And why are you negating it in the in the subsequent one? And John doesn't like it, but I could have still made it very well. Um, uh, no, because I can't tease a. a with a restricted relative clause, I can test to see if the relative clause is part of the elided part or not. So John yeah. likes the pizza that I bought, and so does Mary. It has yeah. to be the pizza that I bought. And if I concoct a situation where um, Mary likes a pizza that I didn't buy, then my sentence is false. And so I can t I can test whether the relative clause is part of the anti of the elided VP or not. But I can't test if the uh, um, if the non-restrictive relative clause is part of the VP or not, because a situation where it's uh, non-part is, is an impossible, is a contradiction, is a logical contradiction. Uh, and so I'm wondering, so how do you know it's not part, other than a, sort of a gut feeling that, yeah, I mean, I have a gut feeling that it's not part of it too, but I can't test it. Right, mm -hmm. yeah, I have to think about that sentence yeah. more. Okay. Mm -hmm. But anyways, yeah, sorry uh, for taking so long. Yeah. Okay. Oh, but that was a, a great discussion, I think. Uh, <laughs> we will, uh, uh, let's thank uh, Jason uh, uh, one more time uh, for uh, an interesting talk on the Superman language. Uh, it's uh, 11, so I think people need a little bit of rest uh, uh, or like a little break. Uh, we were gonna uh, start the uh, uh, breakout room, but like maybe we can have a discussion all together after Mark's talk uh, for the uh, interest of time. Let's stop the recording for now. Uh,